Luke, the second chapter. Glory to you, Lord. In those days, a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem because he was descended from the house and the family of David. He went to be registered with Mary to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of a great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they, were, they made known what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. There is nothing like an event that gets people's interest all across the world and binds people together. An event that gets people to talk. Something that brings people together from all different backgrounds, all different classes, all different ideas and opinions, and binds them with something in common. I know you're all here tonight to get my thoughts on the latest Star Wars movie, The Last Jedi. <laughs> you thought I was going to talk about Christmas, right? Yeah. When I finished watching the movie for the first time, I kind of sat there and I felt a little bit deflated, a little bit unfulfilled. See, I'm one of those super fans, so since the last movie, The Force Awakens, ended, I was into all the theories. I was pursuing all the questions, and it wasn't just that I would talk about it with my friend, but I was that guy looking for spoilers everywhere. I even followed this guy on YouTube, and I would constantly be reading, and I had this picture in my head based upon all the information I had received over the last two years of what the movie was going to be, what was going to happen. And so I counted down the months, the weeks, the days, the hours, and then it came. And it was over. And it didn't go any way the flow that I thought it was going to go. It was a completely different thing than what I thought. And for a little while I felt empty. But then I thought about it, and I realized that the problem wasn't the movie, the problem was me. It was my expectations, my preconceived notions, my picture in my head of the way things were going to be in the movie. So the next day, because that's the kind of fan I am, I went back and I watched it again. And this time I set aside all my expectations and just tried to watch the movie with all the foreshadowing, all the messages that were there for what it was. And that's when it grew on me. That's when I realized that this is just another classic chapter in the, in the Star Wars saga. Things didn't go the way I expected, but they were very realistic. Whether it was our heroes or the way evil seemed to be told in the story, it was just a beautiful thing to behold. 
How often does that happen to you in your lives? You have certain expectations. You have preconceived notions. You have a sense of entitlement of knowing where things are going to go and expecting them to get there, only to find that when things don't go that way, you miss the blessing that's right in front of you. Once upon a time, from a young age, we are conditioned to hear fairy tales and stories that have a happy ending. As we move through life, what happens? Good always overcomes evil in these stories. The guy always gets the girl in our stories, and the hero always prevails in our stories. Whether it's once upon a time, or it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, or a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, every one of those stories that we love always seem to follow this pattern. So we've come to expect this in our lives. And yet something funny happens on the way on the journey of life, doesn't it? All of a sudden we realize pretty quickly as we grow up that life is not a fairy tale, that it's not a Hollywood Hallmark Christmas story that always has that happy ending. Now I'm convinced that one of the reasons we love our fairy tales and our happy ending stories is because they serve as an escape for us from the realities of life that are often before us. How many of you have had a picture of the way you thought your life was going to be? How many of you had certain expectations of how things were going to work out, only to find that your life and reality hasn't been anywhere close to what you dreamed it was going to be? A long time ago, little girls would dream about that day they would get married. They'd have pictures in their head of their wedding dress and meeting their prince charming and riding off into the sunset to be happily ever after together. And yet statistics today are showing that marriage is on the decline. The dream is over, folks, because many, many generations have experienced the pain of broken relationships, of things falling apart. Over the last century or so, we've had so many advancements in science and medicine that we've nearly doubled the average length of life expectancy. We've come to a place where most of us expect that if we get anything, there's going to be some sort of cure for it. Things are going to be made better. And an interesting thing is happening over the last few years. The average life expectancy is beginning to go in the other direction. It's starting to get shorter. The reality of substance abuse is taking hold. The overuse of antibiotics is also becoming a problem. And so what we see again is how fragile the human body is, how fragile life is. Parents used to tell their children that you can be anything you want in life. You can grow up, you can make a difference. You can even be the president of the United States. But nowadays, as we look at all the corruption, the abuse of authority, what rational parent would ever say to their child, oh, you can become president one day, or you can work in government and serve the greater good? And we tell our children to reach for the stars. We say to them, as you grow up and you figure out what you want to be in life, pick something that's not a job. Pick something that you're going to love doing, but you get a little reward for it also. So we tell them, follow your dream. Go to college. Get a degree. You know what the number one asked for gift was this year for Christmas? Help with student loan payments. That dream is gone also. People are so burdened down by their financial aid debt, their student loan debt, and many of them don't even have a job in the degree that they acquired in the first place. And so they are in an entry-level job that they abhor, burdened by these financial payments. Sadly, for too many today, life has not been a fairy tale or a happy ending Hollywood Hallmark story. But it's turned into a B-movie horror story. In those days of the creed, the greatest story of all time begins with those words. Not once upon a time, not a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, but in those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus 
that all the world should be registered. A lot of people have tried to discredit this Christmas story and the birth of Jesus, saying that it's a myth or a fairy tale or just something to try to make people feel better. But as we look at the Christmas gospel, what we see is it's filled with reality. Real people in the real world facing real life situations with real motivations. In my own faith journey, one of the things I come to love about Christmas and the Christmas story as well as so much else of the Bible, is how very real it is. In those days, Emperor Augustus. We know from sources outside the Bible, from history, that Emperor Augustus was real, and the census was ordered, and that he had some pretty good political motivations for it, that if he got all the people registered, he knew who was in the population, he could tax them for the benefit of the government. That's real stuff, folks, and that's the setting that God chose to send his son into the world. While Quirinius was governor of Syria, what does this matter to the story? If that line wasn't in the gospel, would it affect why you're here tonight or what the gospel tells us? Absolutely not. We'd still get the point that Jesus was born of Mary and Joseph in the manger as he was the savior of the world. But that seemingly senseless note is in the gospel lesson to remind us there was a real guy, Quirinius, in the real world at the real time that God sent his son into the world. And it's not just with the Christmas story. But the Bible, from beginning to end, is filled with these types of gems to remind us and show us that our faith isn't some fairy tale, some wished happy ending story, but it's a real story that takes place in a messy world to show us the real love of God. But the thing I love most about the Christmas story is where Jesus came into the world. It's not a place that doesn't exist anymore. It's not a place that didn't exist back then. Oh, little town of Bethlehem. And you can go visit the place where God came into the world as a baby in the manger. How powerful is that? We love to glamorize and clean up our picture of Jesus' birth. We have our beautiful nativity sets with their cute little barn and stable and their nice little people that we put in the right places when we put them on our mantles and everything else. But... In reality, Jesus was born in a, in a cave. In a cave. They wouldn't have barns and stables back then. That comes from the Middle Ages and the artwork that was there. And when you go to Jerusalem, just outside of Jerusalem is the little town of Bethlehem, David's royal city. And you go to the Church of the Holy Nativity, which we had the opportunity to go to in the spring, and you can kneel down in the cave and touch the place. Where God came into the flesh. A very real baby in a very real world, very messy place to clean up the mess that exists around us. And over and over again, every single day, people go to that place to experience that aspect of that story. One of the reasons that the Star Wars saga for over 40 years has been so beloved to me and for so many people in the world is that it tells that classic story of the battle between light and darkness. Right? From the beginning of time, from the beginning of history, whether you're a person of faith or not, you know there is a battle between light and darkness, between good and evil. And 700 plus years before the Savior would come into that little town of Bethlehem, the prophet Isaiah in our Old Testament lesson talked about what would happen when the Savior came. He said that the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. There's that battle, there's that theme, darkness and light. We know it's the darkness of sin and temptation and death that so often breaks up our plans, our dreams, our expectations for life. And that's why Christmas and the real reason and celebration of Christmas is still so vital and important for us because it reminds us that even though our lives all too often don't have that fairy tale happy ending, that the God who created us and loves us understands this and isn't satisfied in leaving us in the midst of the mess. 
Christmas is the message and the story to us that when our expectations are unfulfilled, when things don't go the way we plan, God moves into our lives to rewrite our story. When we feel alone on the road of life because our expectations have let us down, God is with us. That's what it means to have a manual. Jesus is our Lord. When we have not lived up to our own expectations, no less God's expectations, God comes to us by his grace and forgiveness to give us a second chance. And when our earthly stories end in the sad reality of death, by our baptisms into the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, God rewrites the ending of our story so that it says, and they lived happily ever after. Amen.